GitHub has redesigned their code search and they have released a blog giving us some insights on how they did it. In this video, we will take a look on some of those insights. Look, the problem with traditional searching is that it is not meant for code, but for any text in general. The search system for code should account for various structures in uh, various programming languages and give the users an easy interface to find those structures in code. For example, if I search for some text, the result should come up saying that there is a function with that name or there is a class with that name and uh, on clicking it should directly jump to that function or that class. Also you might want to search with regular expressions. You might want to search for punctuations like a dot because those things come up a lot in uh, programming languages. So you see search for code is kind of a challenge of its own and this prompted github to create a new search engine for code specifically from scratch and they used rust to implement it apart from unique requirements for code there is also github scale right like they tried to index everything on elasticsearch and it took them months to do it like at that time they had only 8 million repositories now they have more than 200 million of them and that code is always changing for every typo you fix in your code or every test you ignore in your code and you send in that small commit. Okay, so for all these reasons, the uniqueness of a code search problem and uh, challenges of GitHub scale, they need a new search system. A search system in many ways is a way to query a database. So you will see many design patterns used here, which are also used to design databases. So that's why studying about one system actually helps you to think about others. Okay, so look. Every time there is a search, the system cannot go out and search all the code that it has, right? It would be very slow in that case. They need some way to narrow down their search. And that's why there is something called an index, which is used in any database or any search system to narrow the radius of search. Like let's say there are a million total entities, the index would help them to narrow their search down to few thousand of entities, something like that. Here they used an indexing technique called an inverted index, which is a very popular index for most search system. Now to understand this, let's consider these three contents, right? Um, so we have three documents and all of them has some kind of code, right? Now to create an inverted index, what we are doing here is that you see this word hello appears in this document and this document, so document one and document three. So in the inverted index, we would mention that content, the piece of content that we want to search for. And then we would say number one and number three, because those are the documents that contain this word hello, right? We will do the same for hi, because this hi is contained only in document two. Right. And not just word, we can put in the other metadata too. Like let's say for a particular project, we want to know that how many files are written in Rust and how many files are written in Java. Right. So this inverted index would tell that Rust is being used by document one and two and Java is being used by document three. Generally, when you organize data in a database, you have an ID which acts as kind of a primary key in the database and it points to its corresponding content. In the case of search, to search this content easily, we invert this index. So now the content that we want to search is in the primary key column and their corresponding document IDs or their corresponding uh, primary indexes in this table is given here. So now pieces of content uh, in this inverted index points us to some document IDs with which if we search our main table or our main index, then we will find those documents in full. So you see that we're inverting the main index and having the uh, content, uh, the pieces of the content in the primary key column and have the document IDs as its values. That's why we are calling this thing an inverted index, right? They further store all the n-grams of a particular token. To understand what an n-gram is, let's take an example with this word limits and n equals three, which means we are searching for trigrams, right? So what will we do is we will consider groups of three letters in the word limits and this would be the trigram software. So they are storing all this in the inverted index. And so you see for each n-gram, they will also store the document IDs where it appears. So they will store all these n-grams in the inverted index that I explained earlier. And in the index there, not only there will be these n-grams, there will be other metadata too, like code file paths and which repository they are in, like what are the access patterns and everything like that. GitHub created a system to store n-grams of various sizes for each tokens. Like that can be n equals to two, n equals to three, something like that, right? They've given some details of the exact algorithm behind this, like how they are figuring out n-grams for multiple values of n from a single token, but we will not go into the depth of that today. Suffice to say that this whole index cannot be loaded in memory at once, right? So like this 
doc IDs, the list of these doc IDs won't fit in memory at once. So what they do is they store all this on the disk and they have an iterator to lazily load it. So when they need one, they will just load that one in uh, the memory from the disk. And then when they need the next document ID, they will fetch it from the disk uh, lazily, right? So this list will be lazily loaded from the disk one by one for the system to process. Okay, now they have a lot of code documents. How will they store it exactly? They cannot store everything on a single server and uh, let it go because it would be too much for one single server to handle all of it. So they have to somehow distribute these documents on a cluster of servers. And there is a fancy database term for distributing content like this and it is called sharding, right? But the question is how to distribute these documents? They need a key to do it, right? Which is unique for each document, right? Like they, let's say they want to say that key number one to four, you stay in node one, four to eight, you stay in node two, right? They need some key like that. Fortunately, Git uses something called content addressable hashing, which means that each document would have a key unique to its content. So it might be something like the hash of the whole content and when the content changes, like there is some push in the database, this ID or this hash would also change. Look, Git does not see repositories in terms of files on a normal file system with paths. Instead, it sees it as a content addressable file system, which means that every file in a Git repository is identifiable by its Git object ID, which is content addressable in nature. So let's say you have a file, it will have a content addressable uh, Git object ID and you will make a push, the content will change so that file in the latest uh, version of your repository will have a different ob Git object ID than it previously had. This makes job for GitHub easier and it uses this Git object ID to distribute the documents on different nodes in a cluster. So it can say hash ID from this to this or Git object ID from this to this will be stored in node A and then the next will be stored in node B, something like that, right? So they can use this ID to distribute all that content. Okay, now let's see how data is ingested into this index, like how data is read into this index. Look at this architecture diagram. When there is any change from github.com, let's say there is a code push or any change like that, that would create an event and that event would be put on this Kafka queue. This change is captured by the Blackbird ingest crawler. Now Blackbird is the internal name for their search system. What will this Blackbird ingest crawlers do? They will fetch the blob content from Git, extract symbols from it and create documents out of it. These documents will be later stored in our system. Now these documents will be put in another Kafka queue which will be later picked up by the indexing system of Blackbird which would create its indexes with its n-gram and other in useful indexes like on which programming language the code is written in. Then these are put in proper shards uh, using the technique I mentioned before. These shards also run something called compaction which takes multiple smaller indices and merge them in a large index every now and then. Compaction is also a very popular database technique used in many kinds of databases, especially the analytics ones. Now all this is fine and good when there is a new push because there will be a very small amount of uh, content to be ingested. But they also had some tricks up their sleeves to make the initial large ingest faster. So when they're deploying their in system for the first time, they have to take all the code and index them and put this, them into this system, right? So the first point is that due to content addressable hashing, if some piece of content has been analyzed before, it does not need to be analyzed again. Because even if they're part of two different repositories, they will have the same content ID if the file's content are the same. So they created an algorithm to find out the optimal ingest order, which means that they would ingest more similar repos one after the other. So they can use this feature and skip recalculating for some files in some repositories because they will be common to the other repositories. They actually created a graph where each node is a repository and it is connected to the most similar repositories. And a minimum spanning tree for this graph will actually give them an optimum ingest order, right? Because more similar repos will be analyzed one after the other, right? So you see your data structures class wasn't that uh, useless after all. Okay, now let's come to the reading part or how the search querying works. This is also similar to many other database systems. Let's uh, take this query for example, which wants to search for this regular expression arguments um, in this organization rails and for this language Ruby. First, the query is converted into a representation like this, where the system actually injects much more information, like which repo IDs exactly needs to be searched, what is the regex, and for which language ID. 
This is like a standard representation for later stages of the search system. This is then taken and the relevant information is fetched from the index and the intersections and the unions of the data is applied accordingly to get this AND and OR clauses here. And they return the top 100 results for each query to the user. So this was the write and read flows of their code search system. Some more statistics, each shard's response like the P99 response time is in order of 100 milliseconds and it can handle about 640 queries per second, which is good enough. I would guess that they might have some caching layer in front of the system to make it even faster. They haven't explicitly mentioned something like that, but I would guess something like this is there. Their ingest pipeline can publish around 120,000 documents per second. So ingesting all repositories can be done in just three days. Remember when they used Elasticsearch to try this, they needed months to ingest all the data. They have a total of 115 terabytes of content they want to search and due to content deduplication because a lot of data in GitHub is actually duplicate and their uh, indexing brings it around 28 terabytes of unique content to be searched and uh, their all of their indices combined is also just 25 terabytes which is pretty good for a system of that scale so this is all that i had for today do write in comments what did you think about their approach and uh, this video as well leave a like and subscribe to the channel for more content like this bye see you in the next video